Victorian church. We invite you all to stand up and sing with us. She said, saying I have no reason to think I will give thanks. I will give thanks. When the roar that I hear is the voice of my fear, trying to silence this hope in my heart, I will give thanks. I will give thanks. Sing a song of thanksgiving. Sing a song of thanksgiving is my battle cry. With joy as my weapon, I stand in divine. The light of the dark with my hands lifted to the sky. I will rejoice.
They spoke your name into the night And through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is raised Jesus Christ, my living Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages step down from me to wear my sin and bear my shame. Sing the cross. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings draws me. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Sing hallelujah.
morning, guys. How are we doing? How are we doing? <laughs> Man, it's good to hear your amazing voices on the Sunday morning. How many of us came to Trunk or Treat last night? Awesome. Well, it's good to, good to have you guys here this morning. Good to see familiar faces and some new faces. Um, we just want to invite you all to just continue singing with us. Uh, we're going to sing, Oh, Come to the Altar.
this moment we invite all you guys to say hi to one another, greet your neighbor. Bless all of you who served. You guys came to this service and many of you guys were out loving on all these kids, these 1,800 folks that got God brought up. Thank you for all of those labors of love and your generosity. What a great event to encourage our community and to pour into them. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for, for your gifts to Church of the Open Door. Those gifts allow us to function as a church, allows us to do events like that, to proclaim the good news, the incredible love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for being a part of that. Thanks for praying. Thanks for all the candy. It, it was just such a huge, huge blessing. And kiddos, I know that we have you here today. We are so glad you're here. Moms, we're good. I was a youth pastor for 15 years. I could deal with a little noise. Don't worry about it. If they need to stand up and move around or do their thing, 
we are so glad you guys are here, and, and I'm praying that, that God has a message for you guys this morning as we get into the Gospel of Luke. I have a very special reader today. I want to invite Luke Wright to come up, and he's going to share. This is microphone seven, and Luke is one of our brave souls in our kids' ministry that's going to read the section we're going to learn about today in the Gospel of Luke. Good morning. On, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman took the spices that had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the, the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wandering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them, and they, in their fright, the woman bowed, bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Jonah, Mary the mother of James, and the others went with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the woman, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the, the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wandering, wandering to himself what had happened. Good job, buddy. Couldn't have read it any better than that. Well done, Luke Wright. Thank you for that. That was powerful. So when I was in high school and college, um, my older brother, Dan, he was pretty ornery. We were pretty ornery. And we watched way too many scary movies than we should have. We love scary movies. We didn't particularly love the gore, but we love the storytelling. We love the ability of the writers to figure out how to terrify people. And as high school boys, as college boys, we were so curious about what terrified people, what made people legitimately fearful. What were the dynamics? What were the things that caused people to be scared? And we'd always test it out on our friends. We'd always test it out on whoever we we're dating at the time. And we were captivated when, whenever anyone said there was a haunted house, like there's rumors of a so-called haunted house, we would always say, okay, that's our destination Friday night. Late Friday night, we're going to find these so-called haunted houses, houses that look like this. But we're going to go at like 12 or 1, and we're going to play a real stupid game. There was usually a fence you had to climb over. And the stupid game that we would play is how close to the haunted house could you get before you chickened out? So we would creep up, and the, the bravest of the brave souls, which was never me, <laughs> the bravest of the brave souls would knock on that so-called haunted house, and, and he or she was crowned the king of that moment. One of the, the most common themes, if you think about this, if you even think about our culture, one of the most common themes that terrifies people is the idea of the dead coming back to life. Our culture is obsessed with the possibility that there exists a world that transcends death. During Halloween, we get to see this obsession on full display. For a few more days, people's yards are going to be filled with zombies and tombstones and 
skeletons that come to life and ghosts and goblins. And it just feels like, I don't know what your perspective, but it feels like people are more excited to decorate for Halloween these days and even for Christmas, or, or it feels like it's, it's getting close. This is the season where our culture is okay with putting away the scientific method. They're okay to ignore the logic that tells us that the dead do not come back to life. This is the season where our culture invents and passes on stories of these dark resurrections. And all of these horror genres, all of our fears at night, the nightmares that maybe have woken you up in a cold sweat, revolve around this idea of the dead coming back to life. And the idea behind this, in our imagination, this is not a good thing. It can't be a good thing. It's terrible and it's dark and it's evil. Our culture says it, it, it involves revenge or a reckoning or a haunting or at the very least destructive mischief. During Halloween, those who come back from the dead, they haven't come to bring life but to bring more death. And isn't it interesting that as we come to Luke's account of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, we come to this account two days before Halloween. What Luke declares this morning in the section that Luke Wright just read is that Jesus didn't merely become undead, but Jesus defeated death itself. Jesus defeated death itself, and Jesus is the one who was raised, bodily raised from the dead. He is the one who has come back from the dead. Jesus' bodily resurrection is the first fruits of a real and permanent, miraculous resurrection that you and I will experience as well. Jesus came back from the dead not to bring more death, not to haunt, not to seek revenge, but to pronounce his loving victory over death and sin and hell and to offer this resurrection life to anyone who believes. In a few days, everyone's going to pack away their Halloween decorations. All the zombies and tombstones and the skeletons that come back to life, the ghosts and goblins will be packed away until next September and October. But the historical resurrection of Jesus can't be packed away in a box. It can't be shoved back into our garage until next year. The bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is the linchpin of everything we believe and everything we stand for as Christians. John Irving once said, no matter how many times I think about Jesus' crucifixion, I have this great fear in the bottom of my heart that Jesus actually didn't rise from the grave. He says, anyone could be sentimental about nativity. Any fool could feel like a, a Christian on Christmas. But Easter is the main event. If you do not believe in the resurrection, he says, you are not a believer. A famous Christian apologist, William Lane Craig, says, if you are out there as a seeker and you're evaluating all the religions out there, he says you might as well start with Christianity. Because if Jesus did not rise from the grave, you can quickly check that off your list. 
Because everything is held together by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Christ is not risen from the dead, everything changes. He is a liar. His followers are a liar. I am a liar. If Jesus did not rise from the grave, this whole thing, what we're doing right here, is a ridiculous placebo. And our lives are as empty, our lives are as tragic as everyone else's. Luke says a dead Savior is no Savior at all. And this is what the Gospel of Luke asks us to proclaim. This is what you and I must grapple with this morning. But on the other hand, if the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth actually happened... It is total vindication of everything he claimed to be. It's total vindication of everything we believe Christ to believe as his followers. It's a total vindication of this mission and calling that has shaped human history. It guarantees, his resurrection guarantees that he has conquered sin, he has conquered death, and he has conquered hell. And it guarantees that he could do the same for you and me. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to the last chapter of Luke, starting with one. Luke chapter 24, starting with verse 1. Luke 24, starting with verse 1. Luke says, But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. He's talking about the women, and he's talking about Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and Joanna and possibly some other ladies as well. These ladies had no part in Jesus' burial, Who buried Jesus? Well, chapter 23 tells us that a well-known religious leader named Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus. And they buried Jesus in a tomb that had never been used. And John tells us that Nicodemus, another religious leader, helped out. Jesus was placed Friday night in a well-known family documented tomb. It was not a secret location. It was public and known. And Luke goes out of his way in chapter 23 to point out that these ladies saw where Jesus was buried. They weren't confused about the location. They knew exactly where they had put Jesus' body. Jesus was placed in the tomb on Good Friday, and on Sunday morning, after the Sabbath, these ladies came to take care of Jesus' dead body. Luke says, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. What happened to the body of Jesus of Nazareth should be the greatest question in all of human history. It's the most important question that could ever be asked. Jesus' enemies could have stolen the body, but why would they? Keeping Jesus' body in the tomb would kill any Christian movement's The tomb was guarded by the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire became the Roman Empire because they fulfilled their duties, and their duties were to guard that tomb. Did the disciples steal Jesus' body? Well, this was the story that the Jewish leaders tried to promote, but the Roman Empire would have prevented this. And we saw how the disciples act when they were under pressure. Matthew says, when it all went down, the disciples fled. 
And the so-called strongest of all the disciples denied Jesus three times. Pre-resurrection, pre-Pentecost, we're dealing with cowards who forsook their best friend when he needed them the most. Did they steal Jesus' body? Absolutely not. Well, did they just make up this story of the resurrected Jesus of Nazareth? Roughly two years ago, Annette Greek, who's our properties lead, she sent me this picture. This is the picture of our nativity set. Many of you guys recognize it. So it was roughly two years ago. It was, look at, we have the time stamp, December 10th at one in the morning. And you're not going to be able to believe this, but check this out, kids. See this circle right here? You see a trash bag over some of the lights there. And right below, you see a little furry friend. Can you see it? Can you see that little furry friend? <laughs> you can see a furry friend, and it looks like our little furry friendly bear is sitting on one of the benches there. And he is. And he's waiting for baby Jesus to come out. <laughs> you might look at that, and you're like, I'm not sure if I'm buying it, Anderson. But what if I said to you, last Tuesday night, this same friendly bear came into youth group. Came into youth group when all the kids were worshiping Jesus. And he wasn't a back row Baptist. He went to the front row. He went, he went to the front row and he literally raised his paws as the kids were worshiping Jesus. And he started singing. He didn't start singing in English because bears don't speak English. He started singing in bear, whatever that is. And it was this miraculous, powerful moment for our youth. It was absolutely breathtaking. You would say, Anderson, I have a couple problems with your worshiping bear. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple problems here. There's a couple holes in your argument. We used to have friends and their daughter would always just tell fanciful stories. And they would always say, all right, when you're telling a story that's not quite accurate, you need to say these words before you say anything else. Once upon a time. Once upon a time, you might be saying, Anderson, we know how much you like to get attention around here, but before you bust out your worshiping bear story, you need to say once upon a time. Because we have a couple problems with this story. One, bears don't want, wander into youth groups, sit on the front row, raise their paws and start worshiping Jesus. Bears don't do that. The other problem is my kids were in youth group on Tuesday. Of all the things when they came home or when they came home from Chick-fil-A, of all the things that would be number one talking point before they came to bed is they would have said, Mom and Dad, you would not believe it. This bear just wandered in the youth group, sat at the front row, raised his paws. As, as J.G. was leading us in worship, he was just loving every moment. Anderson, no one said anything. And this is the world where everyone has their phones. Anderson, if that happened, every kid in the youth group would be recording this. Instagram would have been blown up. There's no way this, is, this took place. There's no way this happened. Anderson, we love you, but there are no eyewitnesses. There are no testimonies of your worshiping bear. Maybe he wandered in to the nativity at one in the morning, sat on a bench, but it wasn't worshiping. Nothing really happened. 
It's interesting, between 30 and 40 years of the resurrection, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the rest of the New Testament continue to claim what was always claimed by the early church, starting with the early hymns and creedal statements of 1 Corinthians 15, Philippians 2, Colossians 1. They continue to claim the bodily resurrection of Jesus. But if these claims were not backed up with eyewitnesses, if these claims were not backed up with testimonies, this would have been the same as my worshiping bear story. It would not have gone anywhere. They would not be able to get away with any of this. And how does a group of disciples preach the, meser- the, the message of the resurrection of Jesus with such conviction to the point that all of them except for John went to their death proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth? How does this small, unimpressive group of Jews in an occupied, insignificant territory of Rome accomplish what they accomplish unless Jesus arose from the grave? The existence of Jesus' body would have obliterated this movement You can't tell a false narrative where everyone knows exactly what happened. The Jewish leaders would have exposed this as a lie. This is what Luke said happened. While they were perplexed, these women, about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how Jesus told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise And the women remembered Jesus' words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not, the disciples didn't believe them initially. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. I wish it wasn't true, but in, in first century Israel there, the testimony of women weren't strong. If you're going to court and all your witnesses were women, you would be in trouble. So the question is, why were the women the first to see the resurrected Jesus? Do you know the answer to this? Why were the women the first to see the resurrected Jesus? The reason the women were the first to see the resurrected Jesus is because the women were the first to see the resurrected Jesus. That's exactly what took place. And this is interesting if this whole idea that the disciples were in the upper room, they're disillusioned, they're in a panic because their rabbi had been killed, and they decide in the upper room, we're going to concoct a story that we want people to believe about Jesus. John wouldn't be in there and, 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 and be concocting this story and saying, well, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary of James and Joanna, what say they first saw Jesus? If you're creating a believable narrative, you would have started with other witnesses. They didn't start with other witnesses because Jesus didn't start with other witnesses. He very purposefully started started with these women. 
And Luke says that these women encountered two men in dazzling apparel who gently rebuked them for seeking the living among the dead. And if there was any identity to who these men were, verse 23, check this out, boys and girls. Verse 23 says these people talking to the women were angels. People struggle with believing in angels because they do not believe in the supernatural. Jesus asks us to believe in the supernatural. There are things in this world that you can't see or touch or taste or, or, or feel. Starting with our own souls, going out to angels and demons. There's a world out there that can't be tested with the five sentences. And it's these angels that speak to these women The women are coming to this tomb and they're thinking Jesus is going to be in this tomb. And the angels say to these women, you think that Jesus is going to be in this tomb because you do not understand what he said to you. It was clear, but you did not hear him. It was clear, remember in Galilee, the Son of Man must die, be crucified, and on the third day rise. Jesus predicted everything that's going to take place. These women knew that Jesus died. They didn't know that he had to die, and they did not comprehend that the dead, Jesus Christ, will be raised to the living. But dead people don't rise from the grave, or do they? You and I, we don't get to see the resurrected Jesus the way that Mary and John and and Peter and Thomas and later on the Apostle Paul, all of them got to experience the resurrected Jesus in a way that you and I don't. But it's interesting when the resurrected Jesus came to Thomas and Thomas was, was able to see him and testify who he was Thomas says, my Lord and my God falls on his knees and worships Jesus. And do you remember what Jesus says to the rest of us in that moment? It's so important to me and it's so important to you. He says to the disciples, you believe because you have seen me. But he says, blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. Who's he talking about? He's talking about us. We haven't seen the resurrected Jesus like the disciples have. And Jesus is speaking to us in this place. And he's saying, blessed are those who continue to believe even though they have not seen. I need to hear this from Jesus. Because there's a lot of people out there in this world who think I am crazy because I believe Jesus arose from the grave. And there's moments in my heart of hearts where I have moments of doubts where sometimes I think I'm crazy for believing that Jesus arose from the grave. For many here, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, it might still feel unconnected to the rest of your life. In your heart of hearts, you might be saying, well, what difference does it make to me today? You might say, my life still feels so fragmented and full of pain. My kids or my grandkids are still struggling. My marriage is still hurting. My finances, my wealth, my circumstances, all these things still declare that I'm coming up short. Anderson, what difference right now does it make that Jesus arose from the grave? 
You think about the disciples, in one sense, the resurrection of Jesus didn't change anything at all. Rome still occupied Israel. Titus was still going to march on Jerusalem and destroy the city in 70 AD. The religious authorities still had a bounty on all the disciples' heads. There was still death and sin and evil everywhere. People still got sick and died. Life was still incredibly painful and difficult. What difference did it make that Jesus arose from the grave to those disciples? You look at the life of these disciples post-resurrection, post-Pentecost, and you're not dealing with the same person you were prior to those events. None of them are defeated. They live such hard lives, and none of them are defeated. None of them are licking their wounds. They're not living trivial, meaningless existences. Instead, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you see this remarkable undertow of resurrection joy. And it's this resurrection joy that transcends all of their brutal circumstances. Life was no longer just a series of unfortunate events. It was this miraculous resurrection joy adventure. An adventure of hope and reconciliation and relationship to someone who would never leave them, someone who will never forsake them. And what we see is the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. The lame were made to walk and the dead were raised to life. And never have we seen a group so bold to proclaim the love of Jesus. Never have we seen a group so bold to suffer for the Lord. Never before have we seen any group that cared for each other with such intimacy and humility. And this story of the resurrection, the story of the resurrection began in Jerusalem. And if there was one place that that could have obliterated this story from the get-go, it would have been Jerusalem. But the story of the resurrection goes beyond Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And it wraps around the globe, keeps on wrapping around the globe until the story of the resurrection comes to us here in Glendora, in the San Gabriel Valley in 2023. We're going to learn in a few weeks in verse 46. Jesus' commission from the Gospel of Luke. He pulls his disciples together and he says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus says, you are witnesses of these things. And he says to us here at Church of the Open Door, you are witnesses of these things. You have a message, and it's one glorious message. It's the love and grace of Jesus Christ. It's his death and resurrection. It's his authority over sin, evil, and death. And he has come to bring resurrection life. Think about my four kids who are in high school, and I pray for them often. And I think about junior high and junior high and high school, and these were really rough years on me. And as I look back at this stage, I did really well when when I was in class, and then I was absolutely terrified by passing periods and lunchtime. <laughs> What I learned early on is that I could find a refuge from, 
from the mean teenage world. I could find a refuge in the library. <laughs> Any of you guys in junior high and high school find a little refuge in the library? I would pretend to have, uh, I'd pretend to have homework and I would go and hide away from that mean, cruel teenage world. And I just hung out in the library. The librarian loved me, of course. And I'd hang out with others who were pretending to do homework in the library. And we'd look through the windows of the library. And both of my schools had windows all around. And we could see all that was happening out there. And we're, we're all secretly saying to ourselves, we are so thankful we're in here. And then you realize, after, after you spend some time in the library, what you realize as a child of God is that God is actually wanting to push you out of your library. <laughs> He's wanting to push you into that mean, cruel, teenage world, that world out there. And he wants to push us out there with this mission and this message of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to go out and preach the glorious love and grace of his death and resurrection. And the truth is the, the historical fact of Jesus' death and resurrection, it doesn't instantly wipe away your pain or your grief or your disappointment. But as Christians, you're going to discover something. You're going to discover the undertow of, of the joy of the resurrection. And the joy of the resurrection is going to move your world and your life out of meaningless, meaninglessness. It's going to move your world and your life out of the trivial and it's going to move your life into great purpose and significance in the Lord Jesus Christ. And our refrain for all of us, our refrain is this. If Jesus arose from the grave, what else can he do? What else can he do in my life? What else can he do in the lives of those I pray for? If Jesus arose from the grave, what else is he wanting me to be a part of? What else shall I ask him to do? We have the joy right now to transition to the Lord's table. I'm so thankful for the children to be in here. JG is going to come back. He's going to play a little music. And mom and dad, we'd love for you to take this moment. If you haven't already, it's always good to review, to explain to your kids what this is all about. Why we partake of this mystery wafer. Why do we partake of this little thimble of juice? JG is going to play, and, and we are going to prepare. And kids, you're going to see moms and dads all around you, and they're going to be bowing their heads, and it looks like they're meditating, or it looks like they're praying, and that's exactly what they're doing. They're thanking the Lord Jesus Christ for his amazing sacrifice on that cross. So we want to give you as a family and just us privately a few moments to prepare for this table and then we're gonna when you're ready we're gonna partake of all this together as a church family
you would get to that first layer. This wafer is a symbol. It's a symbol of our precious Savior's body that was broken for us. This is how the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of Jesus. same manner he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes Once you get settled, if you would stand, if you'd stand for our closing prayer and our last song. Father, your word says, blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. We have not seen, yet we believe. We believe and proclaim the resurrection from the dead and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his victory over sin and evil and death. He did not come back to haunt us. He did not come to bring a revengeful reckoning. He came to bring life, eternal life, life everlasting. And we want to praise him right now. We want to we want to speak of his power and glory. We want our friends all around us, sitting all around the aisles around us right now to hear us testify through our lips the glorious and risen Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray, amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus fled and died for me, I see his wounds, his sins, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all
is on the sun of heaven rose again oh trample death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ the King hallelujah oh Thank you so much for worshiping with us. God bless you and have a great week.